welcome back to my home. So I thought I would take you a little bit around one of the most magical places and one of the places that I love the most in Ecuador. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Nancy. I'm an entomologist, which means I study bugs and I also do ecotourism here in Ecuador. So since there is no tourism in quarantine, I thought I would bring you around virtually. We are in the mangroves. This is Boris in the back who's helping us uh, motor around what I am useless and just talk at the camera so thanks this is a new ish style of video if you like this kind of thing be sure to like it and subscribe and also comment that you want more of this so I'm gonna stop talking at least from this angle and flip the camera around and show you a little bit through the mangroves so here we are in the heart of the mangrove. As you can see, these roots that are coming down, they're really important for not only water filtration, all the water so far has been salt water, but it eventually turns to fresh water. All of these roots really help filter the water. They provide really amazing habitat for small fish um, and for shrimp and for other small marine animals, which I'm not very well versed in because I don't study vertebrates and ocean things. They're really important habitat for a lot of different animals. Interestingly here you can see that dark line on the roots. That's where the high tide comes up. So we're almost all the way up to high tide. During low tide you could actually walk through this and a lot of the locals still come in here and dig through the roots to try and find clams and crabs and bring them home to eat and stuff. So if you get crab in any of the local restaurants here, it could have come from the mangroves. These areas are actually also a really important sanctuary for many different types of birds. The mangroves typically were used in a lot of construction because they're really strong and because the roots curve so much, it's easy to make various different shapes. So not only are they insect resistant, but also you can get a lot of pretty decoration from them as well. These are some of the tallest mangroves in the world. There are 50 species of mangrove worldwide. Ecuador has seven, and there are four commonly found in this area of Ecuador. So these aren't even the tallest mangroves. Here we are coming up to the part where we'll start getting a transition from these mangroves into the jungles. Over there, right in front of us, those are the jungle is a secondary forest and they stop right here because of this water that's still pretty salty so it can't get any further whereas on this side you have the mangroves because they can put their roots in the salt water and they're still okay we have weighed anchor and we're going to walk around a little bit so you guys can see on foot so these roots that are sticking up, these come from the black mangroves and they stick up out of the ground and then can become little new plants. I love these kind of open grassy habitats like this because they are so good for finding insects in general. And if we try and come over here. There is a pretty old female peacock butterfly right here. Just hanging out. She's a little bit old. You can see her wings are tattered, but you can also tell she's a female because the males are a lot brighter. The brown is almost black and the orangey is actually like a bright red on the males. So then after this field, so this field, we then go into the jungle. Preserving ecosystems like this is actually really important because even though this is mostly secondary growth, about on the coast, about 95% of the habitat has been deforested for various reasons. Um, just, you know, human expansion, logging, farming, monocultures. And so I really like bringing people out 
here to these areas because I like to show them that, you know, Ecuador is really unique in the fact that we have jungle on both sides of the Andes. Normally you'd expect a rain shadow effect. You'd expect something like Peru where there's the Amazon on one side and desert on the other. It's so humid. I can't tell if it's my glasses that are fogging up or the camera lens that is fogging up, but regardless, I look blurry. So <laughs> sorry if that happens. The reason why we have jungle on this side of the Andes is because of the Humboldt current and also I forget the name of it, but a current that comes down the side of um, the side of Central America on the west on the western side. And because of those two currents, we have there's a vine. Because of those two currents, we get upwelling and cold water that swells up on this side of the Andes, which creates a its own wind current, which goes from west to east instead of the prevailing winds that goes east to west, which is why you get the Amazon that's wet. But since we're on the western side, a lot of people are surprised to find that we have this really lush jungle here. And I really like working with locals who do their best to conserve it and bring tourists to these areas so that way other people can see that, hey, no, there's more to Ecuador than just the Amazon. There's different types of jungle. There isn't just the Amazon. And I'm hoping that kind of showing off places like this helps us, I guess or people or this area stay conserved there are people who are working and who will buy up little chunks of land and make a mosaic out here but so far like this this land isn't owned by anyone in particular so it just happens to remain intact um, because the locals want it to but for who knows how long that's gonna gonna last so bringing tours out here and really showing the local communities that ecotourism can be a thing that sustainable tourism can be a thing that you can use this land. It's not just useless or wasted, which is what a lot of Ecuadorians would say this land is because farming on it is guaranteed money. Whereas bringing people and doing tourism, a lot of Ecuadorians would consider this like wasted land. So I really like trying to bring people out here. One, because it's not as conserved as the Amazon. And so every little bit that we do is really helpful. But also I really like bringing people out here to show locals and get locals involved in tourism to hopefully try and protect this area. So I just wanted to also let you guys know that a lot of the plants that are found here are actually used by the locals. So like this one right here is called Toquilla. This is what the Panama hats are made out of. They actually come from Ecuador and not Panama, but they're made out of the thinner, younger stalks. These adult stalks would be used for roofing, for example. And if you come right behind me here, these are tagua trees. They don't have any tagua on them right now, but I will insert a clip here. And they're often used in uh, artisan jewelry, artisan work. I work with a supplier and she gets all of her tagua from down here on the coast, although you can also get it from the Amazon. So here's the tagua when it's fallen out of its nut case over there. <laughs> Looks like a potato. It does. And so this is a shell that you have to hack off, which I'm not skilled enough with machete to do, but... Yeah, hey, you did it. I did. All right. So then you hack that off, and you get this second rind underneath, and that's what you polish off for like seven hours. And then okay. you get to the nut inside that you can actually work with. And then you carve it and shape it into... You carve it and shape it, yeah. Cool. Plant ivory. Plant ivory. It actually, it used to be used in the button industry after... Before plastic and before plastic and after we decide killing elephants is bad. Yeah, this is this is what they look like before the seeds fall out. It's just giant widow makers <laughs> hanging off of this crazy tree. This palm. Try and hack Here's another tree that locals use. It's called the pilche or mate tree. And I also have footage of this from an earlier trip, so I'm just gonna dump that here instead of trying to handle the camera and hacking a bit of fruit all at the same time. So play b-roll. <laughs> here today and she's going to show us how to actually cut open and clean out the inside of the mate. So you can't actually use a machete to cut open the mate because the, the machete makes the, makes the mate shatter. And so you actually have to use a saw to cut it open and then use a knife to get it. To kind of open it the rest of the way. So 
this is the inside. It is inedible, and you definitely wouldn't want to eat it if you could smell it. And you need to like cut out the flesh and scoop it out. And you have to be careful because this stuff will actually like stain all your clothes and it'll never come out. And so after you kind of get the big chunks out with the knife, then you can start scooping the inside out with a spoon. Some people use the insides if you if you boil it and mix it with sugar and cinnamon. It's apparently good for kidney stones and for cancer. But other than that, the inside is just thrown away. So we're almost done. We just need to scoop out the last little bit. So after you're done like scooping out all of this stuff, this is, this is what it looks like on the inside. And then we will leave this outside to dry for 24, 24 hours and that's, that's what makes them a little bit harder. And then after that, we can start painting them. We also like clean out the, the top, make little stands. So you can like put your little stand down, and you put, you put your little mate down, and you can display how pretty it is. There are always fun things we had in the jungle. Um, I believe this is some sort of plant that is related to the ginger. I believe it may be sour cane, but the flower is really weird. If you come on in here, in here, this whole red thing isn't technically the flower. It's just those little things in there that are the flowers. Here are other strange flowers that I have no idea what they are, but are interesting nonetheless coming out of this plant. So jumping spiders. You can tell when they're looking at you, because their eyes will be black. A lot of people ask me what kinds of animals live here. We have a few populations of howler monkeys. We have pumas, we have other big cats such as ocelots, and some little, little ocelot looking things called tigrillos, which are about the size of a house cat. We have armadillos, but a lot of the monkeys and other large mammals that are supposed to be here aren't right now just because of the amount of deforestation that's happened in this area and the amount of habitat loss, which is why it's really important to conserve what we do have because it provides an oasis for these endangered and vulnerable animals. As we're coming out of the mangroves, if you notice how a lot of the leaves are yellow, and that's because these mangroves are living in salty water, and so they need a way to get rid of the extra salt. So these mangroves will sacrifice various leaves and pump all the salt out through those leaves, and that's how they filter the water. Some other mangroves will filter the water by excreting the salt through the bark, but these ones sacrifice leaves. These are ibises. Uh, we have, oh, there they go. Oh, I'm bad at panning. There we go. Bye. And so here in this little area, it will get shallower and shallower as the tide goes out. And this is where the bubble pool is. So here's the puka. Come here, puka. At the end, you get to bathe in the mangroves. This area, he's gonna show us. So this area, because it's normally underwater, but then we're during when the tides are, are down, <laughs> air gets trapped under here. And so you actually can just lay down in this bubble pool. So we're gonna get out and hang out in the bubble pool. Bubbles.